Hello. Now, you might remember that this time last year I posted a video about my top five adaptations of Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol. Um, I've actually just reposted at that one. I noticed that the audio wasn't very good, so I fixed the audio, put it up again. Uh, I also noticed that even by my standards, my hair looks ridiculous in that video, but unfortunately there's nothing I can do about that. But this year I thought I'd follow it up with a video about my top five non-Dickens related Christmas movies. So here they are. Number five, we have It's a Wonderful Life. Now, I was kind of in two minds as to whether or not to include this one, because this one is kind of a Christmas Carol again. It's kind of another unofficial remake of A Christmas Carol, except it's Christmas Carol upside down. They've taken the plot of Christmas Carol and inverted it. So, in A Christmas Carol, you have, as you know, a wealthy but miserable man who is visited by supernatural beings on Christmas Eve, who, by means of showing him episodes from his own past and visions of an alternate timeline in which everything has gone horribly wrong, show him that his life has in fact been a bit of a waste of time so far, but there's still time to turn it around, and that true fulfillment can only be found through spreading happiness. Now, in It's a Wonderful Life, you have an unsuccessful but kindly man who is visited by supernatural beings on Christmas Eve, who, by means of showing him episodes from his own past and visions of an alternate timeline in which everything has gone horribly wrong, show him that his life has not, in fact, been a waste of time, as he has come to believe, and that what really makes the world go round is not necessarily the achievements of the great and good, but the common decency of ordinary folk like him. It is kind of the same story, just the other way up. But if you're going to steal, steal from the best. And if you're casting somebody to be the antithesis of Scrooge and Tom Hanks hasn't been invented, then you're going to go with Jimmy Stewart. Number two, Trading Places. And yes, I know John Landis was deeply problematic when this was made and has only got worse in the meantime, but he did have an incredible run of action comedies around the Aventies and this is probably the best of them. Kind of a judgment call as to whether this is a Christmas movie, I guess, but it certainly works as one. I guess this movie is primarily remembered for one thing. Well, three things if you include Jamie Lee Curtis. But it's mainly remembered as the movie that really introduced the world to Eddie Murphy. It was his second film and it's the one that made him the biggest comedy star in the world. But for my money, the real star performance in this film is Dan Aykroyd. The agonizing downward spiral that his character suffers over the course of the first half of this movie is one of the best disintegrations of a human being ever committed to film. And the hairy salmon moment... And if you haven't seen the film, that's not a euphemism. It's perhaps the best depiction of hitting rock bottom that I've ever seen. Number three, Klaus. This is possibly the most obscure one. I think this is on Netflix, and I think it's only on Netflix. Putative origin stories for Father Christmas have become a kind of subgenre of Christmas movie in themselves. Obviously, Santa Claus, the movie back in the 80s, the first half of that is a suggested origin story for Father Christmas. There's been quite a few in the meantime. I understand there's another backstory he's given in Violent Night with David Harbour that's only just come out. I haven't seen that yet. But of all of them, this is probably my favourite. This is a delightful animation and a really visually beautiful animation. It's moving, it's perfectly paced. Do check it out if it's still on Netflix. Number two, Elf. Yeah, I know, really obvious. But here's the thing. There's a saying which has become popular in comedy circles, and indeed I think in general circles, in the last year or so, and it's commit to the bit. Now, while this is a newish expression, the idea it conveys is not new. The idea is if you're going to do something, do it. Absolutely commit yourself to it. Do whatever it takes to sell the idea. And the bigger and weirder the idea is, the harder you're going to have to go to sell it. And Elf is, from beginning to end, an exercise in committing to the bit. Because it is a gloriously ridiculous premise, the idea of Will Ferrell being this great lanky six foot four freak who was raised by Christmas elves and believes himself to be one. And much as Trading Places was the movie that made Eddie Murphy a comedy star, this is the movie that moves Will Ferrell out from behind the Adam Sandlers and Ben Stillers of the world into being a star in his own right. And you've got to say, he seizes that opportunity with both hands and crushes the life out of it. Nobody has ever sold a character harder than Will Ferrell sells Buddy the Elf. But it's not just Will. Everybody goes all out to sell this most ridiculous of ideas. And the casting is audacious. 
I don't know how they ever found the balls to ask James Caan to be in this movie, let alone how they reacted when he said yes. But that's a really effective bit of casting because there's all kinds of actors you could have cast as the grumpy old dad who could have been a bit grumpy and irascible, but you know, they've got a heart of gold and it's all going to go, you don't get that from James Caan at all. James Caan's a scary son of a bitch. He actually brings menace to this part. This is Sonny Corleone, for God's sake. This is Jonathan E. This is the guy who gave Carlo Ritchie's head in with a bin lid and brained Danny Wilkes with a typewriter. And all of that is kind of bubbling under the surface of James Caan's portrayal. Interestingly, of course, it also features an early appearance by Peter Dinklage in which he kind of sets out the manifesto for the rest of his career. Yes, he's a dwarf, but he's also an incredibly serious-minded genius who is not here for your umpa lumpa bullshit. Okay, before I unveil my number one, and some of you have probably already guessed what it is, let's have the dishonorable mention to end all dishonorable mentions. Love, actually. It is one of the most perplexing mysteries of the 21st century the people I know who are intelligent sensitive and discerning can't see that Love Actually is the worst film ever made well I'm speaking slightly out of turn because I haven't seen every film ever made but Love Actually is and I mean this the worst film I've ever seen and I've seen the Room and Plan 9 from Outer Space. But the difference is, while those movies were made by, let's not be mean, delusional Fruit Loops, Love Actually was made by the absolute cream of the British cinema industry. Many of my favourite actors are in this film. A couple of close personal friends are in this film. But it's so bad! No, take that back. It's not bad. It's wrong. It gets everything wrong. Strangely, the film it reminds me of the most is Tommy Wiseau's The Room because both movies feel like they've been written by aliens who've been observing the human race from orbit and have acquired a rudimentary understanding of our language and social structures, but I've literally no idea what human beings say to each other or how they react to the things they say. I may one day do a full-length video about everything that's wrong with love, actually. But this is a fairly well-trodden path. I do recommend you read, in particular, Lindy West's article on Jezebel.com, in which she has a good old dissect of the whole thing. Her principal bugbear is with the horrific sexual politics of the film, which are indeed horrific while we're here. Literally every male character with any kind of position or authority in that film has a female underling who craves him. <sighs> But the main reason I don't think I'm going to do that is because it would involve watching Love Actually again and it doesn't deserve another two hours of my life. About a year ago, I did try and watch it again. I was talking with a friend of mine who, like several friends of mine, actually thinks it's a good movie. And they challenged me to sit down with them and watch it and point out everything that's wrong with it as it goes along. And we got about 15 minutes in and this friend said, all right, stop, turn it off, stop, because you're right. Everything you're saying is correct. And if we watch the rest of this film, it'll spoil it for me forever. And I guess I didn't have the heart to take it away from them. But just in that brief bit of the film that I re-watched, there are three or four clanging instances of exactly what I'm talking about. In one of the earliest scenes of the movie, we see him, Liam Neeson wandering around his house looking sad because, we are given to understand, his wife has recently died. Emma Thompson phones him up and says, and I quote, Oh, come on! Nobody's going to shag you if you cry all the time. <sighs> all right, it's Emma Thompson, and I can forgive Emma Thompson almost anything, but nobody talks like that. Nobody talks like that to somebody who's bereaved. And Liam Neeson just kind of goes, huh, mm, yeah, I guess. No, that's not what you say if you've been bereaved and somebody says something that crass and disgusting to you. But I'm watching and I think, all right, well, maybe, maybe if it's like six months later and he still hasn't left the house yet, you might try and shock him out of his complacency by saying something a bit grim. But no, two scenes later and we're at the wife's funeral. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, she's been dead for a week. So 
In what universe, A, would somebody with a bereaved friend phone them up and say that? And in what possible universe would Liam Neeson, having heard Emma Thompson say that, not say, what the fuck is the matter with you? Slam the phone down and never speak to her again. This movie has no human beings in it. They look like humans. They move and walk like humans, but they're not humans. Then straight after this, you have the great Alan Rickman saying to a woman who works for him, when are you going to shag that hot bloke in the office? Everybody's waiting for you to... Oh, fuck! Can you say industrial tribunal? So no, I'm not kidding, and I'm not using hyperbole. Love Actually is the worst film I've ever seen. And it will never cease to mystify me how some people just don't get this. But fuck love, actually, I'm talking about good Christmas movies. And my number one Christmas movie is, yeah, Die Hard. Now, before we go on, this is not me taking a definitive stance on the question of whether Die Hard is, is not essentially, and by definition, a Christmas movie. I don't give a fuck, all right? I don't give a fuck whether you think it's a Christmas movie or not. That is entirely up to you. And while I'm here, I don't give a fuck whether you put the jam first or the cream first on a bloody scone, all right? No, get the fuck over yourself. Nobody's palate is that refined, although it is scone and not scone. That hill I will die on. But die hard. This is an unimprovable movie. Now, there are a lot of big-budget action movies being made at the end of the 80s. And the thing about Die Hard, it's almost as if the producers thought to themselves, you know, it takes as much money and time to make a bad big-budget action movie as it does to make a good one. So, why don't we make a good one? Because Die Hard is one of those movies where everything is about 15 to 20% better than it needed to be. And the real breakthroughs are in the writing and the casting. The script is magnificent. You can quote almost every line of it. It's also, along with Robocop, one of the two great satires of 1980s America. In Robocop, you've got a near-future America in which everything that was crass about 1980s America has just gotten way worse. Whereas what Die Hard does is it lines up all the assholes of 1980s America and has them all inadvertently conspiring against poor old John McClane. So you've got supposed political radicals who are full of shit and are just in it for the money. You've got the idiot police chief. You've got the idiot federal agents. You've got the scumbag reporter. Everybody in that movie except John McClane and Al Powell is an asshole. But the casting, absolutely inspired. People forget that in 1988, not only was Bruce Willis not an action star, he wasn't a film star. He was a TV star, specifically a comedy TV star. In fact, when the movie was first released, they kind of left him off the poster because they thought nobody was going to take it seriously. But he's ingenious casting. This is coming out of the era of the super jacked up, massively muscular one-man army movie. Your Rambos, your Commandos. And if they'd managed to get all the people who I think they probably would have wanted for the part of John McClane, like a Sly Stallone, then this kind of just would have been another one of those. But one of the things that makes it something else is the casting of Bruce Willis, because he looks like a slightly schlubby, separated dad. He's obviously not in bad condition, but he doesn't look like he lifts weights in his sleep like 80s action heroes tended to. He looks like he's pushing 40. Bruce Willis was actually only 33, but possibly because of the receding hairline, he looks like he's pushing 40. And he's just this regular guy who, at least initially, is hopelessly out of his depth and has to find the wit and resources within himself to beat the ridiculous odds he's facing. So on the one hand, he's a much more relatable action hero than action heroes were at the time. On the other hand, he's a much more vulnerable and fallible action hero. Again, if it had been Sly Stallone, who the bad guys didn't know was hiding in the bathroom when they laid siege to the Nakatomi building, then you would have known that they were toast before the movie got started. But Bruce is definitely going to suffer a lot, and oh boy does he, and there's always the chance that he might not win. And when he does win, it's through sheer ingenuity, which is always an applause moment. And the bad guy, Alan Rickman. Again, it pains me to say, the late... Alan Rickman. Oh my God, talking about seizing an opportunity. Again, not a movie star, not even really a TV star. I've done a few bits and bobs back in Britain. He was a theatre star. He was a stage star. He was in Dangerous Liaisons on Broadway. That's where they found him. 
And oh my God, he not only defines his own career, he essentially redefines the screen villain for the next 20 years. He is so good. Because he's not just sly and villainous and creepy. He's got a weird sense of humour. He's a bit wacky. He also very entertainingly slowly disintegrates over the course of the film as his plan starts to unravel. Possibly my single favourite Hans moment is the scene when they're in the vault and he's helping himself to the money. And Mrs. McLean says, for all your posturing, you're just a common thief. And Alan Rickman springs across the room on all fours to hiss the next line right into her face. Oh, God, he's magnificent. He really is. And that's why we now have in my family a new Christmas tradition. We have Die Hard and Eggnog Night. It's generally kind of our first special night of the holiday. We usually do it around the 21st, 22nd, something like that. Mix up the eggnog, fire up the Die Hard. And always part one. Yes, I know Die Hard 2 hams at Christmas as well, but it hasn't got Alan Rickman in it. And no disrespect to the great Bill Sadler, fuck that. So there you go. Those are my five favourite Christmas movies. And that was surprisingly hard to say. It took a lot of takes. Please tell me about yours in the comments below. And if you're doing Christmas, have a good Christmas. If you're doing something else, have a good one of those. And if you ain't doing a damn thing, have a good time doing that. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, please hit like and share. If you'd like to see more, please hit subscribe. And if you'd like to help me make more, please visit patreon.com slash mitchben.